disciplined. Okay, how, how is everyone? Day three here. <laughs> Probably a little less awake than when I saw you a couple of days ago, but everyone looks happy. So this is your third day, and we're bringing you the U.S. Secretary of the Treasury. <laughs> Now, I'd like to be able to say that this is kind of everyday business here, but it probably isn't, that we probably won't bring you a, a Secretary of Treasury every day, but we will bring you people who are incredibly influential in policy or trailblazers in uh, wonderful multi multinational and, and really innovative companies. So you will get that kind of learning a lot outside of the classroom, which we think is uh, incredibly important, and today couldn't be a better example. So our very, very, very special guest today is Jack Lew, the U.S. Secretary of the Treasury. He has a tall order in that role to promote economic prosperity and to ensure the financial health of the country in the context of a very complex very interdependent global economy. It's a role that has the secretary constantly in the headlines. You've probably seen some recent press about him around corporate inversions, the practice of US companies taking, going overseas and taking over overseas companies, then using the takeover to quote, relocate for tax purposes. Uh, Secretary Liu does more than just fight Congress on budget battles or the debt ceiling or sequestration. His role also thrusts him in the middle of some of the most difficult geopolitical conflicts, which are perhaps more complex today uh, than they've ever been. Uh, from economic sanctions on Russia or Iran, to strongly worded communiques to China regarding antitrust, antitrust probes, to exhorting Europe to boost demand for stability on the continent. All of these issues, while they are major geopolitical issues, they converge on the economy and on economic agendas, which thrusts the secretary right into the middle of them. Now, today's discussion will focus on the state of the economy and global financial stability in advance of the G20 meeting of finance ministers and central bank governors, which will be held this weekend in Cairns, Australia, where he's headed tonight. Now, uh, let me tell you a little bit about Secretary Liu. He was confirmed by the US Senate in February of 2013 as Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, and prior to that, he's led a truly remarkable life of public service. Previously, he served in the West Wing as President Obama's chief of staff. He almost didn't get the job as, as Secretary of Treasury. Word is that President Obama was very concerned about appointing the secretary because he might debase the currency, and we know that's a problem. It's his signature, actually, that would debase the, the currency. I don't know if you've seen his handwriting, but it is, uh, I have, pretty lousy. Thank you. <laughs> Prior to that role, Secretary Liu was the director of the Office of, the Ma of, the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, a position he also held in President Clinton's cabinet between 98 and 2001. Now, it's important to note that during his tenure at OMB, the US budget operated at a surplus for three consecutive years. This is what we mean when we say timing is everything. Secretary Liu began his career in Washington in 1973 as a, as a legislative aide. Uh, from 79 to 87, he was principal domestic advisor to the late House Speaker Tip O'Neill. Now, outside of government, the secretary has also served as a managing director and COO for two different Citigroup business units. And before that, he was executive VP and COO of New York University, NYU. Uh, 
so managing academics might have prepared him to manage Congress. Not quite, but maybe. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the National Academy of Social Insurance, and a member of the bar in Massachusetts and the District of Columbia. He went to Harvard for his undergraduate, and he has a JD from Georgetown. It's also my pleasure to introduce the moderator for the interview this afternoon, Ian Katz. Ian has been a journalist for more than 20 years with Bloomberg, Business Week, the Miami Herald and Associated Press. He's covered the Treasury Department since 2010, before that reported on financial issues. His reporting has won the Overseas Press Club's 2008 Mal Malcolm Ford's Award for Best Business Coverage from Abroad. He's also been a finalist for the Gerald E. Loeb Awards, which is business journalism's highest honor, which we present annually uh, at Anderson, actually in New York, but it's presented by Anderson. Mr. Katz was based in South America for 10 years, including several as Business Week's Brazil bureau chief and correspondent in Uruguay and Argentina. It's really my privilege and, 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 and real honor to welcome Secretary Liu to UCLA Anderson and to turn the mic over to Ian. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Dean, and uh, thank you, Secretary Liu, for taking the time to, uh, to be here and to do this. Um, as the Dean mentioned, you're making your way gradually to uh, the finance ministers, the group of 20 finance ministers and central bank governors meeting in uh, Cairns, Australia, um, which is a long, long trip. I don't know if they could find any place farther. And when you're when you're there, you do a few of these a year, and the last several, the theme has really been about spurring growth, spurring economic demand and spurring economic growth. But yet we see in much of the world, uh, economic growth is still sputtering, especially in Europe. When you go uh, tonight, tomorrow, and you're talking to the, your counterparts, uh, for instance, the finance minister of Germany, what can you say that you haven't already told them? Well, thanks, Ian. And let me start by thanking the Dean and Anderson School for hosting this conversation and for welcoming all the new students here. Uh, it's a special treat to have a conversation in an academic uh, setting like this. Going to the G20 um, is going to um, require us to revisit some issues, as you note, that we've discussed before. But I think uh, it's quite obvious that some of these issues really do require uh, more attention and uh, more discussion. Uh, there's no question but that there is a problem uh, with growth and demand in many parts of the world. Uh, it is uh, not that many years ago that uh, the U.S. economy was not contributing to the solution. It was seen as part of the problem because of the financial crisis. I must say, in the last year, um, the questions have been, why, what is the key to the strength of the U.S. economy? Why has the U.S. bounced back and what do other countries need to do if they want to bounce back as well? And it will mean repeating some of the messages that we have been quite uh, persistently making for the entire time I've been at Treasury and before. And that is that um, stimulating demand in the short term is part of the solution. Uh, there, you can't cut your way out of economic problems. Um, there has to be demand in the economy for an economy to grow. And that's a message that we've carried, and I think there's been some response. We're seeing some more interest. If you look at the focus of the G20 at the last meeting in, in Sydney, uh, and you compare it to the agenda at the meetings before that, the discussion shifted from a discussion of austerity to a discussion of growth. So I think there's a, a recognition that this needs to be addressed. The focus on infrastructure reflects how you implement a policy of growing an economy with demand. Um, now, we don't always have the same view as to how to fund infrastructure. Our view is that it has to be additive to the economy. You can't just move around demand and grow demand. You can't just cut social benefits and pay for infrastructure and have the effect. That's something we can talk through and we can work through. But let me talk about the other end of the equation. Um, th I think that there is a lot of need for reform in a lot of economies. There, structural reforms are necessary for long-term growth. 
So it's not a choice between doing the tough things in the long term and growing an economy in the short term. It's a question of getting the balance right. In the United States, we've been trying to get the balance right. On the financial side, we took tough steps uh, after the financial crisis to reform our financial system, and we frankly have gone farther faster than most of the rest of the world. So these meetings are an occasion where we can help bring the rest of the world along and have a conversation, for example, about how do we build in deeper, uh, stronger capital buffers in financial institutions so that if financial institutions encounter difficulty, they can absorb that themselves. So we have a, an important agenda, uh, and uh, I think we made progress uh, at the last uh, meeting we had. It is pretty far. I don't think there is a place that's farther that these meetings could be at. Maybe but, uh, Hertz was unavailable. <laughs> Well, well, we'll be in Brisbane in November for the <laughs> leaders' meeting. <laughs> um, we'll get back to the G20. I wanted to uh, get to the topic that the dean mentioned, inversions, uh, this practice, uh, practice of moving your address to essentially to cut uh, taxes. Um, a week ago, Monday, about 10 days ago, you said that you were very, that uh, you'd be making a decision in the very near future. Um, but we're still waiting. Should, is anything new, anything you could tell us about when that might happen? And also, you've said that this is not a good thing that these companies are doing. If it is such a bad thing, what is taking so long for the administration to take some action on this? Well, Ian, let, let me start uh, by saying that uh, what I've said consistently is that the right answer on inversions is tax reform. Um, we have a tax code that's broken. We have the highest statutory rate in the developed world. We have an effective rate that's much, much lower. Some companies pay zero while others are paying the top rate. Um, and what we need to do is clean up the tax code, get rid of special provisions, lower the tax rate to 28% or less if we could, and, um, and take away the thing that's driving companies to invert. I've consistently said that inversions are legal but wrong. Um, we have a tax code that drives these decisions. We need to fix this tax code. That can only happen with tax reform, which we look forward to working with Congress on on a bipartisan basis. I believe that this debate over inversions, the public and focus on inversions, now has brought the broad public to understand why we need to do business tax reform. The reason it takes a little while is this is a very complicated uh, uh, law, and we uh, have limited tools administratively. Uh, we have to make sure it's rooted in law and that we do it right and that we do it carefully. Um, I have met with my team regularly on this. I met with them just yesterday, and I'll be talking to them while we're gone. And I'm hopeful that we're going to be able to take action very, very soon. Um, what I've also made clear is that the administrative action we take can't solve the problem entirely. Congress, if they don't enact tax reform, needs to enact legislation that shuts the door on inversions. The actions we take will remove a lot of the economic benefits of inversion, but it will not close the door, and that will require legislation. So it's not instead of legislation. Will, you had at one point uh, made a call for economic patriotism. Are the companies that are doing this, these pharmaceutical companies, Medtronic, AbbVie, and others that are trying to do this, are they unpatriotic? You know, Ian, I think if you look at what, uh, what makes the United States such a wonderful place to do business, um, it's that we have the best educated workers in the world. We have the best research and development in the world. If we continue to do what we've historically done, we'll have the best infrastructure in the world. That's something we need to do better at going forward, but we still have the best infrastructure. And the, the, the rule of law here is something that makes this the most stable place to do business in the world. All those things require governmental support governmental action. And we support that through our revenues. I think it's wrong for companies that benefit from all of the things that we do together as a people kind of opt out and say, we're not going to be having our address here because we want to pay taxes at a lower rate somewhere else. Um, they still want to do business here because this is a, a great market and it's a great economy. So I've never said it's illegal. Uh, we need to change the law, but it's wrong. And, you know, I, I think the language, um, I was a little surprised that people responded so much to the language because it's language that Republicans used in the, in the early 2000s when they enacted legislation on inversions. I actually thought it was a unifying idea of patriotism. 
you know, it, 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 so I think people reacted to, to the word. The concept is one that I, I think there's broad agreement on. Is by taking a while and being careful and not making a decision yet, is this done partly on purpose to have a chilling effect? I mean, folks out there are wondering what the Treasury is going to do, and does this, in effect, work by not making an announcement yet? And I, I uh, thought it was very important to make clear that we were going to do what we could do um, because companies are making business decisions and uh, they should know that there is some very real probability, I've now said certainty, that we're going to take action. Obviously, until we act, uh, there's going to be some question as to what the detail is, and I can't preview the detail until it's all finished. Um, but any company considering an inversion is now on notice that there is action that's going to be taken. Uh, it is our goal to do it as quickly as we can, and I think that it's in the kind of normal time span it takes to do complicated tax policy. This is moving faster than things normally move, um, and uh, it, it's, as I say, very important to do it so that it's done right. Um, soon enough, we will take action, and uh, people will make their judgments as to what the impact of that is. Uh, I, th I think there's no doubt, but it will take away a lot of the economic value. That doesn't mean that it will stop all inversions. Um, and that's why it's so important that the legislative debate continue and that we do it on a bipartisan basis. Um, at the G20, moving to that for a second, uh, one of the issues that surely will be discussed uh, is sanctions against Russia. Um, what else can you do um, to get Russia to behave that the way you would like it to behave. Um, and I also want to ask a, a second part to that. Um, it was reported, we, Bloomberg News, in fact, reported that the administration was uh, irked by um, Exxon, specifically, uh, some of the uh, ventures or attempted ventures it was having with Russia's state oil uh, enterprise. Is, were, was the administration, do you think what Exxon was trying to do broke the uh, spirit, if not the letter, of the sanctions law? So, look, let, let me go to the first part of your question first. The, the, I think these sanctions um, that we've worked very closely with our international partners on, the EU and other countries around the world, the G7, um, have been um, as carefully put into place as any sanctions regime ever. They put an enormous amount of pressure on Russia and the Russian economy. Just this morning, there's a story with uh, the former finance minister of, of Russia, Kudrin, talking about the deep damage these sanctions are doing to the Russian economy. And we've done it in a way that was intentionally designed to cause as little spillover effect on Europe and the United States and the global economy as possible. Now, obviously, as we move up the ladder of sanctions, it's harder and harder to avoid those kinds of spillover effects. But we're still working as hard as we can. Our goal is not to hurt the global economy. Our goal is not to hurt the Russian economy. Our goal is to change the way the Russian leaders are making their decisions. I think sanctions are working to very much make it a reality that Russia is more and more isolated. Their economy is more and more suffering. They're looking at negative uh, GDP. They're looking at drawing down their foreign currency reserves. They're looking at a situation that is not a bright picture economically. Now, until they change their policy, they have to understand that they'll be more and more isolated. So I can't tell you what it takes to change um, the, their calculus. Uh, there's an opportunity now with the ceasefire for this to be resolved in a diplomatic way, which is what we have always said was the goal. The goal is for Russia not to be engaged or supporting a military action in Ukraine to respect Ukraine's borders and to work through a diplomatic process. I hope that that is the outcome, um, but we are going to keep the pressure on until it is resolved. You know, as, as far as uh, individual companies go, I'm, I'm not going to comment on the individual activities of, of, of companies. But I will say that we have worked closely with U.S. Um, businesses and CEOs, including uh, ExxonMobil, to make sure that as we implement sanctions, they understand the sanctions, they can comply with them, and that we avoid doing things that put either uh, people or the environment at risk. 
And I think we've done that very effectively to date, and I hope we can continue to do so. On uh, sanctions, a specific uh, question, could or should um, the United States, Europe, uh, block Russia out of the SWIFT, uh, the international trans, uh, transactions uh, system called SWIFT? That's one thing that's been mentioned. What would you think of that? Well, I'm not going to comment on specific additional actions that we could take, but I will say that as we have worked with Europe on financial sanctions, um, we have tightened the, the space in which Russia can operate financially. Sanctions have direct and indirect impacts. The direct impacts have been quite substantial. The indirect impacts of firms that choose not to do business because they think that they're getting close to sanctionable activities or they might be the next activities to be sanctioned expands the impact of the sanctions. I think Russia has to know that we will continue to look at options that we have to tighten the economic isolation, but I'm not going to comment on any specific. Okay. On um, China's always a hot topic, and you've made it a priority um, in, in the time you've been in office. Um, you sent a letter recently um, to the government there to register a complaint about investigations regarding monopolies. Um, what exactly could you shed some light on the complaint you have and what exactly is the issue that you have with what's going on there now? I engage with uh, my Chinese counterparts uh, in many forms and I'm not going to comment on any uh, specific uh, uh, conversation or exchange that may have happened. But let me say that this issue of the anti-monopoly law is one that we raised at the SNED and we made very clear that uh, if the anti-monopoly law is used to essentially work disproportionately against uh, U.S. and other foreign firms and it's used as a way to create a barrier to doing business or an extra cost to doing business, that that was something that was very much inconsistent with our, the, cl the close economic relationship we're together working to build. And uh, it is something that uh, is one of many examples of how what we need to do with China is talk about how to remove barriers, not impose barriers uh, to doing business. Uh, for China's own well-being, they should want these American firms and other foreign firms doing business there. They need the competition in their uh, economy. They need the ideas. They need the, the, the intellectual capital. and um, and our world economy will be stronger if those barriers are reduced. So we've been very clear in many forms that the anti-monopoly law is something that we, we see as part of uh, this set of issues. And um, uh, you know, I, I certainly hope that they understand how important that issue is to us. How satisfied or not are you now with, it, it's obviously a complex relationship with China, but there's issues, there's things that they've agreed to, bilateral investment treaty, there's the free trade zone in Shanghai, where it seems like there's promises and then the follow through isn't quite there. Um, is, it, is it a case of one step forward, one step back, or is it, uh, how would you describe the state of play right now on, on those opening of economy issues with you know, China? You know, roughly at the same time I uh, became Secretary of Treasury, the leadership in China turned over. So um, the time that I've been engaging with them in this role has really uh, coincided exactly with President Xi's government and his team. Um, I think if you look at what they've done in the last year and a half to two years, they've set forth a very clear agenda of reform. Uh, last year, uh, they had in their organizational meeting called the Third Plenum a very clear statement of what they need to do to make China's economy more open, to have it be more competitive, to bring market forces to bear. I actually think that at core, they understand intellectually that for the future of China, those reforms are critically important to them. So the fact that we say they need to do those things is consistent with what they understand to be in their own economic best interest which is why one has to be a little bit optimistic that there will be real progress here. I have consistently said that the pace of change is frustrating. Now, in fairness, the pace of change in our system is sometimes frustrating as well. Long-term structural reform doesn't always happen in 18 months in the United States. Right. So I think that, that 
you know, 18 months, two years is not uh, an eternity. But there needs to be clear signs of progress, not just because of us. Obviously, it matters to me in terms of the impact on the U.S. economy. But China needs to be focused on how, what their runway is for them to put these changes in place to have an economy that the next 5, 10, 15 years will continue to grow. Now, I think they have, they have real challenges internally. They're worried that some of these reforms uh, will uh, disrupt the social and economic order in a way that will be threatening to domestic uh, stability. Um, that's something that every country has to manage for itself. Uh, I, I don't at all minimize those concerns. But they have to be aware of the fact that if they don't embark on the path and stay on it and make real progress on a regular basis, they're going to turn around and look back and wonder what happened. Because China's economy 10 years from now can't be as prosperous as it should be if they don't put these reforms in place. They have all the signs around them, excess capacity, because market signals have not worked to allocate capital in an efficient way. Um, so I think they know what they need to do. Um, I, I wish that the pace of change was faster because I think it would be a good thing. But you know, I'll give you an example. You know, I must have raised the issue of exchange rates with them already well over a dozen times in conversations. Um, I think they understand that if they want the RMB to be thought of as a, an international currency, the things that we say they need to do to be fair in the way they play on the world stage are also in their own interest in terms of having China be a new kind of world power, which is what they say they want. So I think even there, and we're seeing progress on that. I mean, since my visit there just a few months ago, um, we've seen a consistent trend in the exchange rate in the right direction. I hope we continue to see that between now and when the leaders meet in November. And more importantly, I hope we continue to see that trend after the leaders meeting in November. Speaking of currency, the dollar after the Fed meeting today, a few hours ago, um, the dollar hit a 14-month high, I believe, against major currencies. And it's been hovering around a six-year high against the Japanese yen. Is this a good thing, or is this just a reflection that the rest of the world's economies are not performing well? You know, you know I, I, obviously, I'm not going to comment in any way on, on monetary policy in the, in the longstanding tradition. But I think the core uh, economy in the United States is seen around the world right now is quite strong. You know, we focus on how much more we have to do, because as long as there are people who want jobs who are having trouble finding them, we're just going to be relentless pursuing more economic growth. Um, but around the world, as I talk to leaders around the world, their question is, you know, how do we grow like the United States? So I think that at a time of uh, anxiety in the world because of geopolitical issues, at a time of economic stress in parts of the world, um, the United States um, is, a, uh, is, is both a place where we're growing and seen as a sign of stability. Um, you know, I, my job is to make sure that we continue to be a stable, growing economy, and we're going to do everything we can to maintain that. The strength of the dollar, though, is, rather than monetary policy on the currency, is that something you're, you're comfortable with now? You know, the, the, I'm not going to comment on market uh, uh, conditions, uh, even in terms of the dollar, except, you know, a, a strong dollar has always been a, a good thing for the United States and continues to be. Okay. Um, I think we do have some time, and we want to take some questions from the students. <laughs> Step up and ask questions. There are microphones here. And please don't be shy. This is a, a rare opportunity. So great. Go for it. <laughs> and just introduce yourself by name. Hi, Secretary Liu. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate you being here. Um, my name is Kelly McKenzie. I'm from Texas, and I'm a first year student. Um, my question is about the situation in Syria and Iraq with ISIL. Um, what, is, what are your feelings about um, your concerns regarding the financial impact of the threat that ISIL poses, and how do you counterbalance that with the concerns, financial concerns of a renewed military engagement and the financial costs and burdens of that to the United States? Thank you for asking the question I didn't get to. <laughs> and, and if I could just add that, what can Treasury do about all that? 
So, so let me start with the, 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 what Treasury can do and what the role of finance is. Obviously, for any um, military operation, flow of funds is critical. Um, it's how you support your activities. It's how you pay people. Um, it is very important for us to work with our counterparts uh, around the world to identify and try and shut down as much as we can the flow of funds into ISIL. It's a complicated business because it's not like it's posted up there uh, in a transparent way exactly where they get their money and how they get it. But our people are pretty good and they're working at it and we're going we're gonna to do the best we can to limit the flow of funds into ISIL. I think that um, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, in the broadest uh, sense of the economy, um, right now world oil markets are in a pretty healthy place. There are surpluses in uh, some parts of the world, excess capacity that hasn't been tapped in places like Saudi Arabia that's maintained to deal with a crisis. So I think that should a situation arise, you know, there are, there are things that the world uh, community can do. Um, I don't think that the world can turn its uh, face away from the kind of barbarism that we're seeing in ISIL right now uh, and the threat it poses on a geopolitical or even human basis. Um, and obviously, anytime uh, there's a use of force, there's a cost. And I've always been a believer that you should only undertake a mission if you're prepared to bear the cost, both in terms of dollars and in other cases, uh, in terms of, of, of you know, lives. This is going to be a question of, of cost more than lives because of the nature of our engagement. Um, and it's one that we have to be prepared to bear in order to, to stand up for the things that we believe in and to protect the United States from the kinds of harm that could come if it's not uh, brought under control. Good afternoon, Mr. Secretary Liu. Um, as you can tell, um, we're all so happy to have you here today, so thank you from Anderson. Um, I'm from the UK, and I know a hot topic for us Brits is the Scottish independence, and I know that um, former President Clinton recently came out with his opinion on the matter, um, and he gave a sort of economic viewpoint on it. Could you enlighten us with your opinions on this? So Look, this I, is, this I, is I, in case you were just U.S. centric here. We're now going into the Scottish debate. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think as the administration has made clear, we think a, a strong, united UK is important. The, the UK has been one of our best and most reliable partners uh, for a very long time, and uh, you know, I, I think it's an internal debate within the UK uh, right now. But obviously, there are potentially significant economic uh, ramifications. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think we're all watching with great interest what happens uh, tomorrow. Thank you so much for coming today, Mr. Secretary. Uh, my name is Amichai Bergman. I'm sorry, it's a little bit low for me. Um, I was going to ask you a question about um, the student debt loan. Um, as we know, it's about $1 trillion, uh, about a little bit more than that. And there has been talk about a, a possible forgiveness program or partial forgiveness. And I wanted to know what kind of outcomes, um, effects uh, the Treasury was theorizing would be possible from that kind of move. Well, thank you. Um, you know, student lending um, is principally within the Department of Education. Uh, we have worked with the Department of Education because we bring a certain expertise in, in markets uh, that, that's not uh, historically been at the Department of Education, but the, the, the core responsibility does reside there. Um, I will say that the, the, you know, the challenges of student debt are very substantial. Um, first and foremost, we have to make sure that people can afford to get an education that gives them the opportunity to advance in their own lives. Um, so we have to be careful not to shut the doors um, uh, that are now making it possible for higher education to be broadly accessible. At the same time, uh, people are getting themselves deeply into debt, often um, not fully understanding the consequences of that debt, um, and uh, not always understanding the value of the degree that they're paying for. So I think much more transparency on uh, what is both the burden that you're taking on and the, the track record of the institution that you're borrowing money to attend. 
Um, an awful lot of uh, the student debt problem is actually in a, a, a particularly vulnerable part of the population where people didn't even finish the degree, where they end up with the debt but not the degree. Um, and that is you know, heavily in, uh, it, it, it's not economically equally distributed. It tends to be you know, at, the, at the lower, uh, not the higher end of the economic spectrum that that's more common. Um, and this is a, it's a very complicated issue. We have supported uh, legislation to work on some important reforms here. Uh, and uh, it's something that we continue to work on. Um, and I, I know I personally believe that uh, the right answer is, um, is a balance. We can't, um, you know, to say that we shouldn't let people borrow money to go to, to, to college and graduate school would be a mistake. Uh, but the current system is uh, leading to uh, excess indebtedness in some cases, which is a problem, and interest rates that people can't afford. So we've got a bunch of work to do. Go ahead. So we'll speed it up so we can get through all the questions. Um, thank you again for being here. My name is Jane. I have some questions about the tax reform. Um, with the tax reform, USA being such a powerful country, it's obviously going to affect other countries as well. How do you foresee the other countries going to react and the effects on it? And uh, further on, how do you think that the business globally is going to change and do you see benefit for both the sta uh, United States and the global economy? And to um, how do you foresee reacting to other countries' reaction? Thank Good you. question. Um, you know, at the meetings I'm going to be going to uh, at the end of the week, uh, the G20 meeting in Australia, one of the issues we'll be discussing is an issue called base erosion. Um, it's uh, the tax system being eroded by countries, shop, companies shopping around for ways to either shelter income from taxation or find a lower tax rate. Um, it is something that we're not the only country in the world worried about. Um, we're in a uh, particularly bad position right now because we have the highest effect, uh, uh, statutory tax rate in the world, which creates the biggest incentive to move your money uh, elsewhere to avoid taxation. Um, the rest of the world, I think, views our tax reform as a way to level the playing field and to reduce a lot of that incentive. So I actually think there would be a lot of international support. But I have to say there's a tendency internationally for there to be a bit of a race to the bottom. To, if, we, if we lower our tax rates, other countries can lower their tax rates more. You can always create a differential if your goal is to beggar thy neighbor and have the lower tax rate to attract corporate headquarters to your country. That's something we need to work through on an international basis, and it's an issue I intend to raise when I'm in Cairns later in the week. Um, it, is, uh, it, it is not uh, something that's uh, uh, limited to one or two countries. It's a pretty broad set of concerns. Uh, but I think tax reform in the United States would be seen as a very positive move internationally, um, even though I think it would be something that was beneficial to the United States and creating a more hospitable environment for business in the United States. Thank you very much for being with us, Mr. Secretary. My name is Jake Graham, and I'm curious about your opinions on growing wealth inequality in the United States, and what, if anything, we can do to slow or reverse that growth. I think that um, inequality in income is one of the very significant problems we face in our country today, and it's not new. It didn't just happen because of the recession in 08 or 09. It's been developing over two, three decades. And it's something that um, I believe is a matter of concern, not just in government or in, 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 in academic environments. It's, it's a concern to business people who worry about the kind of social fabric of our country. Now, you might ask, why don't they do something about it and change some of the pat practices that contribute to it? Um, I think that you know, we've made clear that the bottom end of the income spectrum a minimum wage is part of it. We should not have a minimum wage where if you work full time in this country, you're below poverty. It's just, it's wrong. So that's something we as government can do. Um, at the high end, people are doing pretty well. I mean, I think the, the question you know, is how, what's happened in our economy moving um, income and wealth from uh, salaries to capital um, and how do we drive more of it to the middle so that we can continue to fuel the engine that's really driven economic growth in this country, which is 
the, the thriving, prosperous middle class, which has been a magnet pulling people up and a source of economic strength. Um, I think there's no easy solution to that. You know, part of it is we have to make sure we continue to grow the economy so that we're continuing to have more and more opportunities created. But we need to drive that with the best R&D so that we have the, the, the competitive edge against the world, the best education so that our workers can come and add value even in a highly technological environment. Educated workers add value that machines can add and it creates more and more opportunity. Um, and it's going to mean some uh, reevaluation in the, in the corporate world about um, compensation structures. And, uh, you know, we haven't seen a lot of pressure on wages in this country in this recovery. You know, we've seen good GDP growth. We've seen good reductions in unemployment. We've good, seen good um, uh, growth in, in uh, business optimism and consumer optimism. But wages have been pretty flat. And uh, that, that's something that, uh, you know, at the bottom end, we can deal with through a minimum wage. But it's got to drive it through the system. Uh, and uh, that's something that I think is a concern that all of you, as you go to business school and you think about the kind of delivering for the bottom line and delivering for shareholders, um, how th that is distributed in terms of wages versus uh, retained earnings is part of the issue. And, um, you know, Look, our tax code is always a big uh, piece of it. We fought very hard and successfully to raise tax rates uh, on the very wealthy. I must say, since we did that in January 2013, you haven't heard a lot of complaints from people who are paying higher tax rates. And my experience with people who are most affected by that is they were embarrassed uh, at the notion that that was a tax benefit that they needed. Um, you know, we can do more uh, to reform our tax code uh, and, and help people in the middle. So we've got a lot of work to do. Um, I, I wish I could say there was a simple answer. I don't think it's a two-year or a four-year solution. I think it has to do, as I, as I say, the structure of the economy as much as anything else. Um, but I do know it's in the best interest of our country if we have a strong and growing middle class and if we have a business that grows strong middle class workers because that's what creates demand and that's what creates growth and that's what creates a better business environment in the future. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for addressing our class today. Uh, my name is Henry Silverman. Uh, your two predecessors have written in the books they have uh, released recently that while they succeeded in the policies that uh, they enacted uh, to counteract the financial crisis, they failed in properly communicating those policies to the American public. Uh, so I'm curious what y the administration or you are doing. I mean, you're obviously here today right yeah, now. Yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> but doing to, con to counterbalance that. You know, um, I, I, I think that the, uh, the reality is that there probably was no communication strategy that could have taken the edge off of 2008. Um, some things are a communications problem and some things are just a problem. Two, 2008 was just a problem. <laughs> um, you know, I think that the solutions are complicated. They don't easily lend themselves to, you know, conversations uh, that, that are easy to understand. I will say that I try to translate the very complicated into things that people can understand because I think it's important and uh, I hope I have some success in that. But, you know, things like uh, making sure, what I was saying earlier about the conversation we're going to have, about making sure that, that banks have a sufficient cushion that they can bear the risk that they take on themselves and not have that risk shifted to either governments or taxpayers. It's a pretty simple idea. The mechanisms that lie under that are very complicated, but the, the idea itself is not. And uh, you know, when financial institutions push back because they say we don't want any more burdens, um, it's important that people understand why we're doing it so that it, it, it's in a context. Um, you know, our goal is to have a strong and vibrant uh, financial sector. We want the most competitive, deepest, richest you know, environment to do business in the world. On the other hand, we want the safest as well, and we don't want American taxpayers to ever again be in the position where they have to pay the bill when the, you know, investments or, or, or gambles didn't pay off. We are much stronger now than we were before the financial crisis. In terms of capital, in terms of resolution, how you work through you know, having a, a large financial institution 
uh, go under. Uh, in terms of working uh, with our international partners, one of the things that was a complete crisis in 2008, 2009, was no one knew what the consequences of in, around the world were if a bank went under in the United States or in Europe. We're in a better place. We're not done. We have, a, we have more work to do. I think that there's a tendency um, to wish a, a problem were solved and you just move on. This is a situation that will always require our attention because the financial industry is continuing to evolve, which is a good thing. It's evolving and it's, it's part of the vibrancy. We need to continue to keep our eye on what are the new risks and hopefully communicate it in terms that people can understand. I'm going to disappoint most of you here. There's probably time for one more question given the Secretary's schedule. Sorry. First off, Mr. Secretary, thank you for coming to spend your time with us today. My name is Ryan Schmidt. Uh, my question for you is, or uh, what I wanted to ask you was, most of what we talked about today can be seen as contentious topics. And I'd love to get your thoughts on what you think it takes to effectively communicate your views on these contentious topics with your counterparts in China, Russia, and other countries. And Congress. Yes, <laughs> and Congress. Um, you know, the, the, there's no substitute for personal relationships. Um, I think you'll find that is true in the business world as well as it is in the public sector. Um, I've invested a lot of time over the last two years in getting to know the people that um, I interact with internationally because if you don't know each other, it's very hard to communicate effectively. And the distances are large, and uh, it means you know, flying four days to spend two days at a meeting and not sleeping much for a week. But if you don't put the time into it, you don't develop the relationships. Um, I think you have to listen. Um, you can't just be in broadcast mode. Uh, and that, this is true in all the settings, that contentious uh, issues are our you know, definition of the world. Others define the world in, in a different way through their own lens. Now, obviously, we think we're right. That's the nature of having differences. We think they're right. Others think they're right. I think it's different when you're dealing with a country that it, what Russia is doing right now in Ukraine. We have tried talking at many levels, um, but you know, it's, not a, it's not a communication issue. I mean, their, their goal is one that is completely inconsistent with both law and what the, the community of the world considers to be acceptable uh, behavior. Um, you know, on many of these issues, there's gray areas. But there's some where it's just black and white. And on the things that are black and white, you just have to state clearly that this is not something that can be kind of talked to around. And that's why we go to something like a sanctions regime with Russia. That's a form of communication. I mean, we're saying you will be more and more isolated economically and more and more isolated on the world stage. It's not, um, it's not the most warm and fuzzy kind of communication, <laughs> but it is communication. Um, you know, I, I, hope that, um, I hope that one of the things that uh, we can achieve in Washington is to build an environment uh, where there is more of that kind of uh, back and forth uh, communication as well. It hasn't been a great uh, three years in Washington in terms of people sharing their differences in a respectful way. Um, I think the American people are tired of that. The American people expect uh, the tone of public discourse to reflect the way they would run their own lives. It's something I've been committed to for my whole professional career, and it's something I'm going to keep working at, even uh, though some days it can be pretty frustrating. <laughs> so I'm going to take the prerogative to ask the last question, which is perhaps a little self-interested here, given the group. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you spoke about the criticality of education, not just in bridging the inequality gap, but for American competitiveness. We're a class of 360 here, some of the greatest minds in the world in terms of the MBA population. I, I say that with, with absolute accuracy. A third, a third of our students are international. And they may have some challenge despite their incredible talents and their incredible education in staying in this country. Yeah. Could you answer what your policy um, recommendation would be as secretary and then also as the managing director of city? You know, I, I think the, the question of 
immigration reform, which is really at the heart of what you're asking, is critical to our economy. I, I could talk about immigration reform without ever talking about the economy because it's such an important part of who we are and uh, how we've succeeded. But I could also never talk about why it's the right thing to do and only talk in pure economic terms. If you look at the economic path for the United States going forward, and economists agree that the demographics in the United States lead to you know, a, a reduction in our potential GDP growth if our economy is limited by current immigration policies. It is important for our economy to have a growing, thriving workforce. You take that up a level to the funding of some of our most important programs, like Social Security and Medicare. If we don't have immigration reform, we're foregoing the easiest way to help close the funding gap in these programs, because if the labor force grows and the payroll base grows, the revenue comes in from that. Then you go to companies, uh, whether it's a financial institution or a high technology firm, that you know, look at the work you're doing here at UCLA training people, and they're saying, we need those minds. We need those people. Don't tell them they have to leave the United States. It is, it is counterproductive for us to put so much of our American resources into training people and then saying, but you know, we're not going to make it possible to work here. So I think that the economic case for immigration reform is an extraordinarily powerful one. When you look at 10, 20, 30 years and look at what are the things we could do to grow economic potential in the United States, I don't know any one thing that's more important than immigration reform. Now, on a, on a kind of who we are basis, we, d we are a nation of immigrants. We're a nation where one generation after another, we've become a stronger country in almost every way because we've opened our doors. We've done it in a way that's been controlled but has been welcoming. Um, I think that's the future of the greatness of our country as well. Well, I want to thank you, Mr. Secretary. What a privilege it's, it's been and for sharing really the complexity of your role. I mean, this is not about economics. It's about the future of America and the future of global society. And thank you, Ian, for pitching those great questions. And Mr. Secretary, we hope you come back again and again. We thank will you. be always welcoming. Thank you. Thank and you. Good, and luck, good luck, luck as you go forward. Thank you. Great trip. It's a long trip. It's very long. <laughs> I've learned to sleep on planes. <laughs> And you now have a 10-minute break to reconvene.